Chapter 10, The Lesson of Play, D.K. One day, I visited 79-year-old Lorraine at the hospital. She had just been diagnosed with lymphoma. With white hair and bracelets, she was sitting up in bed talking with her family. Despite the grim outlook, I remember feeling that I was intruding on a happy family gathering. I introduced myself and asked if I could come back another time when she wasn't as busy. Sure, I love visitors, she said with a smile. As I left, I wondered if she knew exactly why I was visiting her. But she was very aware of what was going on. She was dealing with cancer. When I came back the next day, Lorraine had the radio on and was dancing in the privacy of her room with all of the enthusiasm of a 17-year-old. As I watched her, I thought about a cliché that nonetheless seemed so true in this moment. She was dancing as if there was no tomorrow. Lorraine looked over as she shimmied about. I smiled and said, What you doing there? The Watusi. And why are you doing the Watusi? Because I can. She was right. We want to play because we can yet we also suppress the urge. Fortunately, Lorraine knew how to let herself play, even when facing serious illness. End decay. The dying make the need for play perfectly clear. As you listen in on their conversations with loved ones, it's obvious that those moments they had shared in their leisure time, in their fun time, at play, are the moments that matter at the end of life. They'll say, Do you remember the time we went to the beach? And, Do you remember when we rode our bikes in the country? They'll reminisce about all those Sundays when we took the kids to the park and the funny faces Joe could make. The answer to the question, Why is play a lesson? can be found in deathbed regrets. The number one regret people have when they look back on their lives is, I wish I had not taken life so seriously. In all our years of counseling patients at the edge of life, we have never had one person look at us and say, If only I could have worked an extra day a week, or if only there were nine work hours a day instead of eight, I would have had a happier life. People look back on their work accomplishments and other achievements with a sense of pride, but realize that there was more to life than that. They discover that if their work achievements weren't balanced by high points in their personal life, the work feels empty. They often realize that they worked hard, but they didn't really live. As the saying goes, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. It also makes for a dull life, one that's out of balance. We're here to enjoy ourselves and to play throughout life. Playing is not just a pastime for kids, it's our life force. Playing keeps us young at heart, puts passion in our work, and helps our relationships thrive. It rejuvenates us. To play is to live life to its fullest. Unfortunately, play is usually given a low priority. While it is true that placing a high priority on work is useful, since we all must take care of ourselves and our families, this priority has been taken too far. Too many people feel a desperate need to be constantly productive, successful, and always achieving. This generation knows how to do, but doesn't always know how to be. The problem is usually not that someone is working eight hours a day at his or her primary job, then an additional four nights to make the mortgage and put food on the family's table. If you absolutely must work two jobs to make ends meet, then you must work the two jobs. You may find yourself working nights and weekends, not to get ahead, but just because your job culture requires it. If it's temporary, it may be worth it. But if that's just going to be your life, 
If you're never going to have nights or weekends off, you may wonder if, if it is worth it. Many people work all day and then work nights to get ahead, forgetting why they were trying to get ahead. And if they go out, it's to an event that provides good networking possibilities rather than to a get-together that simply offers fun. Weekends are turned into catch-up-and-get-ahead time at work. When these people do attempt play on the weekends, they can't escape the nagging feeling that they're wasting their time. To get ahead, we tend to leave the loved ones behind. We think we want to give them more, but mostly what they want is us. Yes, success and control are important, but so is play. We have an innate desire to play, to release, to let go, to dispel our stress and tension. Unfortunately, we have suppressed the urge to play and sometimes forgotten it's there. Many offices will acknowledge employees' birthdays, often bringing in a cake or balloons. These balloons usually get scattered about, perhaps rising to the ceiling in the offices and hallways. If you watch workers going to the coffee machine or colleagues' offices, you'll see them playing with the balloons as they pass, swatting them with their fingertips, pulling them down by their strings and watching them rise back to the ceiling, tying them around their fingers. But they will do this discreetly when they think no one is looking. These highly productive people are starved for play, and many people are just like them, kids without balloons. We've forgotten to play. We've forgotten how to play. We've even forgotten what play is. We have to remind ourselves that play is doing the things that bring us pleasure, for pleasure's sake. Play is an experience of fun that transcends all boundaries. Anyone can play with others of the same or the opposite sex, of any race or religion, of any age. We can even go outside our species to play. Most of us derive great joy from playing with our pets. Playing is our inner joy outwardly expressed. It can be laughing, singing, dancing, swimming, hiking, cooking, running, playing a game, or anything else we have fun doing. Playing makes all aspects of life more meaningful and enjoyable. Work becomes more satisfying. Our relationships improve. Play makes us feel younger, more positive. It's one of the first things children learn how to do. It's natural and instinctive. Isn't it sad that most lives have so little pure playtime? When people ask how they can afford to spend time playing, I answer that they can't afford not to. Play adds balance to our lives and improves our mental states. We work better when we have played on our off time. Whenever people tell you they are burnt out from work, ask them what they really love doing. If they tell you they like the movies, ask, when was the last time you saw a movie? Usually they'll say, oh, a couple of months ago. To stop doing what you love is an invitation to burnout. Playing also helps us physically. Many scientific studies have shown that laughter and play reduce stress and trigger the release of substances in the body called endorphins, which are chemically similar to morphine. These natural painkillers and mood elevators may be why we feel better after laughing and playing. They give a natural high to our lives. Laughter is a self-fulfilling medicine, for the more you laugh, the more you laugh. Even when dealing with a subject as serious as death, Humor has its place. EKR An academic class on death and dying for medical and psychology students was open to the public. The teacher, who had not thought someone who was dying would ever enroll in his class, was surprised when just that happened. Worried about the privacy of this terminally ill woman, he never shared her condition with the class. Later he said to her, 
My main concern was that someone would make a joke about dying or make light of it in some way. But this is a real matter to you, not just an intellectual exercise. The woman replied, Joking and playing are life. Laughing is one of the ways I get through this. If your students had made jokes, it would have been fine with me. The thing that offends me the most is when someone avoids the subject or won't say the words death or cancer. I'd much rather joke about it because laughter is much more fun than dread and more real than avoidance. And EKR. DK. Jacob Glass is an author and lecturer on spiritual principles. One afternoon I found myself chatting with this old friend at a local coffee house. He shared with me how he will often begin his day there, reading, enjoying his coffee, and visiting with friends. He lives not far away in a simple place that meets his needs quite well. As we talked about his lecturing and about his writings, I found myself urging him to do more and more, explaining how he could expand his work schedule. And then what? he asked. Then you could lecture more times per week, have the American dream, and someday retire. And then will I have time to sit in the coffee house, relax, and read? Sure, you could do anything you wanted. But I can relax now. I have days off. I have time to enjoy my life, to take walks, to see plays, to have long lunches. Why should I focus all my time on being productive so that some day I can enjoy my life? I'm enjoying it now. I overlooked that Jacob already had the life I was telling him he could enjoy some day if only he worked more. And I realized that while I was supposed to be relaxing and having coffee, I had fallen into the trap of thinking about productivity, emphasizing work over play and decay. Work and play do not have to be completely separate activities. It is good to find the fun in your work. Finding enjoyment in daily tasks helps us get through the day and through our lives. Unfortunately, it's too easy to become purely goal-driven and then unhappy when we don't reach every one of our goals.